Let's define the Purdue model. The Purdue model, also known as the Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture, PERA, is a framework that is widely used in industrial control systems to help organize and describe the different levels and functions of an industrial control system. The Purdue model is based on a hierarchical structure with each level having a different set of functions and responsibilities. Let's start bottom up. Level zero, or the process level, is the lowest level of the Purdue model and represents the physical processes and equipment that are being controlled and monitored by the industrial control system. This includes sensors, actuators, and other devices that are used to measure and control the physical processes. Level zero, or the control level, includes the devices and systems that are used to control and monitor the physical processes at level zero, and this includes PLCs and RTUs. Level two, or the supervisory level, includes supervisory control and data acquisition systems, SCADA, that are used to monitor and control the process at level one. This includes HMIs, historians, and other software tools that are used to monitor and control the industrial process. Level three, or the manufacturing level, includes MES, or manufacturing execution systems, and other software tools that are used to manage and optimize the production process. This includes scheduling, quality control, and other functions that are used to improve the efficiency and quality of the manufacturing process. Level four, or business planning and logistics, involves higher level business functions such as ERP, supply chain management, and business intelligence. Meanwhile, level five, or the enterprise level, is the topmost level that encompasses strategic planning and decision making for the entire organization. Lowest four levels are usually referred to as the manufacturing zone from level zero to level three. Now let us discuss in general, how does the SCADA architecture work? Let us define some terms here, IO or the input output devices, which are instruments such as sensors and actuators or control devices. These devices are normally installed at the field to collect signals and measurements such as temperature or transmitter. The direct signals from the IO devices can be in either analog or digital. Analog IO usually refers to measurement from instruments, while digital IO could be flow meters, device status, command bits, uh, detector switches, etc. RTU in a SCADA system plays the role to scan and collect signals from IO devices in the field. The RTU will convert these signals to digital. These data will be collected and at the determined polling rate. So normally it's set based on both device and the operator. The converted data will then be sent to the SCADA systems for acquisition and processing. As compared to PLC, RTU are more usually suitable for wider area telemetry. And they mainly use wireless communication. PLCs are similar to RTUs, however, a PLC also connects to the IO device directly to obtain real-time signals. They are more popular among local area control plants. RTUs normally have more input outputs than a PLC. Besides, the configuration of a PLC usually requires extra programming to script right in order to perform any logical task. From the networking perspective, communication network is the link that connects everything together. This includes the connection between RTU, PLC, SCADA systems, which serve as the transportation infrastructure for all the required digital data and commands. The supervisory systems, as you must have known by now, is the central system or brain which transmits, receives, and processes the digital data from RTUs, PLCs. And HMIs are the front-end interfaces used by operators to interact with the supervisory system to monitor and control the automation process. 
Now, let's start with the level zero. What do we have there? We mainly have sensors and actuators, which are essential elements of the embedded systems. These are used in several real life applications, such as flight control systems in an aircraft, process control system in a nuclear, uh, nuclear reactor, power plants that require to be operated on an automated control. You know, sensors and actuators mainly differ by the purpose both provide. The sensor is used to monitor the changes in an environment by using measures. Meanwhile, the actuator is used when, along with monitoring, the control is also applied such as to control the physical change. So mainly the sensor detects and the actuators actually move objects. Here is the main difference between the sensors and actuators. From the function perspective, a sensor is a device that detects and measures physical properties such as temperature, pressure, humidity, and converts them into electrical signals that can be processed by the control system. An actuator, on the other hand, is a device that receives electrical signals from the control systems and convert them into physical action, such as movement or adjustment of a valve or a motor. From the input-output perspective, a sensor is typically an input device, since it provides information to the control system, an actuator, on the other hand, is typically an output device since it receives commands from the control system and performs physical actions. From the liquidation perspective, sensors are usually placed at strategic points within the industrial process to monitor and measure various physical parameters, while actuators are typically located near the device that needs to be controlled, such as a valve, a motor, or a switch. Complexity-wise, sensors can be relatively simple devices that measure a single physical property, or they can be complex devices that use multiple sensing technology devices to measure multiple properties. Actuators can also be simple or complex depending on the nature of the physical action they perform. From the response time perspective, Sensors generally have a faster response time than actuators since they need to detect and measure changes in physical properties in real time, while actuators may require a certain amount of time to respond to commands from the control system and perform physical action. There are various types of sensors used in industrial control systems, each with its own unique characteristics and applications. Here are some of the most common types of sensors used in industrial control systems. We have the temperature sensors that are used to measure the temperature of a system or process. They can use a variety of technologies such as thermocouples, RTDs or resistance temperature detectors or infrared. We also have the pressure sensors which are used to measure the pressure of a gas or liquid within a system. They can use technologies such as strain gauges, piezoelectric sensors, or capacitive sensors. We have the flow sensors, which are used to measure the flow rate of a fluid within a system. They can use technologies such as electromagnetic, ultrasonic, or thermal sensors. We also have the level sensors, which are used to measure the level of a fluid or material within a container or tank. They can use ultrasonic capacitive or radar sensors. We also have the proximity sensors, which are used to detect the presence of an object or material in close proximity to the sensor. Humidity sensors are used to measure the level of humidity or moisture in the air or within a system. Meanwhile, position sensors are used to measure the position of an object within a system. By definition, the actuator is actually a device that transforms a certain form of energy into motion. As their mechanism converts energy into motion, we can categorize them based on energy sources. So we have the electric, pneumatic, hydraulic, thermal, mechanical, piezoelectric, and electromechanical. The electric actuator are actuators that use electric motors to convert electrical energy into mechanical motion. 
They are widely used in a variety of industrial applications and are known for their reliability and accuracy. Pneumatic actuators use compressed air to generate mechanical motion. They are commonly used in applications where high forces and speed are required, such as the automation of manufacturing process. Hydraulic actuators, they use pressurized fluid to generate mechanical motion. They are commonly used in an application where high forces and precision are required. The mechanical actuators, they use mechanical components such as gears, levers, or linkages to convert electrical or manual input into mechanical motion. They are commonly used in applications where simplicity and reliability are key considerations, such as in the control of valves or dampers. The piezoelectric actuators, they use piezoelectric effect to generate mechanical motion. They are commonly used in applications where high precision and fast response times are required. Electromechanical actuators, they combine the features of electric and mechanical actuators. They use an electric motor to drive a mechanical mechanism such as a screw or a gear to generate mechanical motion. And they are used in applications where high precision and force are required. From the level one perspective, some of the well-known PLC manufacturers are Siemens, Allen Bradley, Schneider Electric, Mitsubishi Electric, ABB, Omron, Delta Electronics, GE, Hitachi, and the list goes on and on. Here are some of the most common PLCs used these days. We have the Siemens, Schneider, AB, Mitsubishi. You'll find them almost everywhere. Level two, it includes systems that are responsible for process controls and monitoring such as DCS and SCADA and HMIs that we have discussed before. As we said earlier, from the level three perspective, we have the manufacturing execution system, the MES. We also have the process historians. We also have data acquisition systems. Mainly this level is about scheduling production runs and managing the resource allocation to provide reports on production performance. Between level three and level four, there is a zone called IDMZ or an industrial DMZ. It creates a barrier between the IT and OT networks. Solutions like jump boxes can provide limited access to industrial control systems from the IT environment, but this buffer also helps prevent infections coming from the IT environment and spreading over to the OT or vice versa. It's very important to have this industrial DMZ between the IT and OT networks. So what are the main industrial control system functions? We have three main functions. We have the view, the monitor, and control. The view function involves displaying the current state of the industrial process to the operator. It provides an overview of the process by showing relevant data, such as temperature, pressure, flow, rate, and other variables. The operator can use this information to monitor the process and identify any issues or anomalies that require attention. The second function is the monitor, which involves continuously monitoring the process to ensure that it is operating within safe and optimal parameters. It includes the use of sensors to measure various parameters such as temperature, pressure, and flow rate. The control function, it involves adjusting the process parameters to maintain optimal and safe operations. It includes the use of controllers to regulate various process parameters such as temperature, pressure, and flow rate, and the use of actuators to adjust valves, pumps, and other equipment to maintain these parameters within the desired range. The control function can be automated or manual depending on the complexity of the process and the level of operator involvement required. 